Okay, my original plan after I unboxed this was going to be turn it on, power, check the power supply, turn it on, power it up, and see how well it had held its calibration since 1935, or excuse me, 1945. And uh, therefore I had just gone ahead and powered it up and the smoke leaked out of the capacitor that went bad, or was, was bad. And then the rest of the time I spent trying to track down the correct documentation for this schematic, so on and so forth. So none of that got filmed. So where this thing picks up is where I'm deep into the troubleshooting of getting this working again. Um, just a word, I don't remember if I mentioned it further down the video. These will not operate unless the headphones are plugged in or a headphone jack is plugged in. Because these were designed originally to run on battery, there's a switch inside and when you pull the headphone jack it kills the heater current so that the batteries aren't depleted. And as soon as you plug it in, it turns on the current again. Now there is an off position over here, but when you close this up, you have to pull out the phone jack. So that just guarantees that before you put the thing away or take it, you know, go to move it, when you unplug your headphones, your standard headphone jack or plug is fairly long. Can't close the door with it in there, so you would ha automatically have to pull this out, which shuts the unit off even if you forgot to shut off the main switch. So it was kind of a backup to make sure that the batteries didn't go dead, because I'm sure they went dead quickly enough as it was. There uh, were four basically number six dry cells, which you can't get anymore in series for the six volt heaters. And uh, a bunch of 22 and a half volt, I think six for the 135 volts DC. I may be repeating myself here, I'm not sure. But, uh, so we'll pick up with where I was on the troubleshooting after I got deep into it and decided I should probably be uh, recording some of this for somebody else out there who bumps into the same problems as I did on this one. So, here we go, jumping into the meat and potatoes. Okay, I've been working on this BC-221AK for a while, trying to get the thing up and going. The VFO oscillator is up and going. The 6SJ7 audio amp is working. That was after replacing these molded paper capacitors. And I couldn't understand why the military would use molded paper caps until I came across an ad of Micromold from, from Micromold, 1945-46 vintage, that spoke about how there was a mica shortage due to the war and Micah Mold was making these very reliable molded paper capacitors in this form now because of the mica shortage. And if you see the amount of mica that's inside of vacuum tubes and the number of vacuum tubes they must have made during the war, I guess it kind of makes sense that there was a mica shortage. But we're paying for it today. In fact, when I put voltage to this, the smoke leaked out of this one. <clears throat> but the crystal oscillator won't run. And I was down to where I, I was suspicious of the crystal. But I kept looking at this schematic and I kept seeing this six picofarad cap and this one mega ohm resistor that I couldn't find anywhere. So I said to myself, if I pull the tube and I pull the crystal, there's nothing else in the circuit but a variable capacitor the six picofarad cap and the one mega ohm resistor. And at that point, I said, this has got to be uh, a mica cap somewhere, six picofarad. And maybe the one mega ohm resistor had drifted way, way out of tolerance. Is this in frame? I hope so. There we go. So I've got the tube pulled and I've got the crystal pulled. A variable cap's not going to be an, you know, it's an open circuit as far as DC resistance check goes. I said I'll, I'll check across the crystal socket, even though I can't see these two components, and I'll check this one mega ohm resistor. 
So that's pins three and pin seven, and I don't know if you can see the ohm meter in the background. So I'm gonna come down here on pin one, two, three, and seven. And we've got a dead short there, absolute dead short. So I'm guessing wherever that capacitor is hiding, it's not a mica and it's gone shorted. That's the only thing that's in the circuit is that resistor and that capacitor at this point. You can see the crystals out. We got a variable cap. We've got a six picofarad cap and we got a one mega ohm resistor. There's no grid connected. There's nothing, nothing else in the circuit. Not this is not a you know, there's nothing. And I looked in the back, you see these two nuts? Looking down inside of here, there's a little can. And I'm guessing inside of there is that one mega ohm resistor and that capacitor. I hope that's in the camera view. Yeah, I think it is. Okay, so I'm going to pull that out of there and be right back. Okay. I don't know if there's enough light down in there to see it. Sure enough, there's a one mega ohm resistor and a six picofarad capacitor. So just to verify, I'm gonna take my meter and go down in there. All right, this leg connects to one side. This wire right here goes up jumpers over and it's on one end of the cap and I'm gonna to go to the other end of the cap and sure enough that's a dead short. Now that's gonna be a hell of a place to get into. I guess if I take this shield out of here it'll give me a lot more room to work so there's two screws here and I think yeah, it looks like there's two screws on the other side. Get that shield out of there and we'll, we'll uh, deal with that capacitor. Okay, with that shield out of the way, I should be able to get in there and change that cap. There's some kind of a variable coupler right here looking a little grungy. But I'm going to leave well enough alone. That's part of the VFO circuit. And uh, the VFO appears to be working fine. I can see it, you know, trace on the scope. When I turn the hand wheel, I can see the frequency shifting. So I'm not going to mess with that. Uh, I suppose another thing you could do would be clip these two wires over here, take the little spring off the tube socket and drop the tube socket out. But I think I've got enough access to get in there and uh, pull that capacitor, so I'm going to do that. Alright, this is totally bizarre. I've never seen this one before. I got the leg of the cap lifted. and. <clears throat> of course the connecting wire here I had to get it out of my way so I thought I had my short gone until I went here and touched this lead and I've got a short circuit that's a trimmer capacitor a rotary type trimmer cap and it appears to be a dead short never seen that before at least not on one that wasn't physically damaged. So I guess I'm going to swing that thing around 180 degrees. Maybe it's got corrosion built up between the plates. I don't know, but I've never seen a trimmer cap do that before. But looking at it, that uh, rotating plate is mighty close to the fixed one. I think I got a bad trimmer cap. Very unusual. Can I get in there where I need for a screwdriver? My kingdom for a small screwdriver. There we go. Let's fit it. Yes, it will. And again, I'm not too worried about aligning this thing afterwards because I've got all the equipment to dial it in. But... Oh, yeah, those plates are rubbing. This trimmer cap is junked. How the heck does that happen? All right, they won't even remesh. They were so out of alignment that now it won't remesh. Guess I'm going to have to pull that thing completely out of there. 
All right, there's something wrong with the trimmer cap. That's uh, that's a first, especially on a piece of military gear. Yeah, that, whatever's supposed to keep that down. All right, I'm going to take it out. Stop speculating. Get it out of there. And there we have it. The plates are running into one another. Now this, I would have assumed, was just a lock nut to uh, prevent it from rotating once it was in position. And I'm turning that, and it's not doing anything. This has to come way back for those plates to align. Hmm. Yeah, turning this is doing absolutely nothing. There's no threads. So what the heck is the deal? What is supposed to hold that back? Unless this is supposed to be swaged on there. Evidently that's what it's supposed to be. And that's failed. Absolutely failed. Wow. That is bizarre. That's the first time I've seen that failure. Let me see what I've got in my junk box. I've got a bunch of trimmer caps in there. I might have one. And here's the failure. This little nut isn't a nut. It's just a pressed on collar that maintains the position of the shaft when it's all assembled. And if you look right there very carefully, it's cracked. It's split open. And when it's split open, the spring tension on the contacts down in here shoved the shaft down so that the plates collided with one another and made a dead short. And it just split open right there. Whoops. Knocked it over. Now I do have a couple of different options here. I went on eBay and looked and uh, you know it's like $25 for you know they're getting 17, 18 bucks plus like 5 bucks shipping. I can uh, change the mounting. This one mounts on two standoffs here. One side of this is grounded anyway. The uh, rotor is grounded so I could easily use this one which will self ground just slip it through the hole tighten the nut up and it's a 12 pico farad this one here I can uh, pull a couple of plates off of this one easily and turn that into a 12 pico farad it's about the same size in fact they are they are the same size plates it's just a different mounting configuration. So that's one option I've got. I've got this guy here, which is a lot smaller. I'd have to drill a couple of mounting holes. I'd rather not drill any holes in case I ever come across an original. The shaft is the same diameter as that hole, so this one would probably mount right in with no modifications, just using this nut, pull a couple of plates. And I might give a go at repairing this one and uh, if I manage to do that we'll show you what I did the tricks going to be this contact this sliding contact is basically a spring and pushing this down and getting the plates to line up correctly holding it there 
while I solder that. Maybe I'll drill a nut, try drilling a nut and press fitting it on, see what I can do. But there's a considerable amount of spring. It, it, I can't even push it in with my thumb. That, that's a lot of tension on that spring. And they do that so you get a good contact on the wiper. But we'll come up with something and when I've uh, got a fix I'll show you what I did. That turned out to be a very easy fix. Bend a little tab back up here. I took a standard hex nut and drilled it so it was a two thousandths press fit on that shaft and just push it, pushed everything together very carefully until I was centered and we have a variable capacitor again. The original one will go right back in. Nobody, nobody will ever know that it didn't work. Very straightforward. You just have to be careful when you're pressing that you don't press too far and your plates end up dragging the other way. I just very carefully snuck it in, snuck it in. I uh, had a sleeve, oh, here, as a matter of fact, piece of tubing to go over the end and I just put it in the vise. That's why this was bent down so I could press against that end of the shaft. The vise, I do have an arbor press, but uh, you got a lot more control with the vise. You can just slowly sneak the screw in. And uh, the plates are almost perfectly centered. This would, should work just fine. So we'll put that back together and see if we have an oscillator. All right, we have the crystal oscillator working now with our repaired capacitor. And uh, I've let this thing run for about an hour and then tweaked it. And presently it's sitting at two tenths of a hertz high. There's a little instability in the last digit because it's not a perfectly clean sine wave. I think they do that intentionally so it's rich in harmonics. And that Hewlett Packard uh, 53181A frequency counter is accurate be because it's running from a GPS stable, uh, GPS controlled oscillator or frequency standard that's known. Well, it, it has a frequency error of its own. They, they are known to be actually 9.999999.9998 hertz instead of 10 megahertz, which means it's decimal 0002 low in frequency at 10 megahertz, which means the frequency reference for a megahertz is off by 0.00002 are two ten thousandths of a hertz. <clears throat> so I'm pretty confident that that one megahertz and three tenths, now it's climbing a little bit, 0.3. I'm pretty sure that oscillator is pretty close to where it's supposed to be at this point in time. It's probably set more accurately now than it was in 1947 or six whenever this was made. That's the date on the uh, 1945 is when this was fungicidal, fungicidally treated, so 1945. I bet they didn't get it that accurate then. And it's going to move around a little bit, of course. It's not an oven-controlled oscillator. There's no PLL loops in these. When you put it in the case and it gets a little warmer, the frequency is going to shift a little bit, but it'll probably remain within 1 or 2 hertz. These have a claimed accuracy that's supposed to be not any worse than about 100 hertz. Uh, that's after all the frequency multiplication and the heterodyne oscillator and so on and so forth. Now yesterday, I'm going to turn some lights back on. I turned them down because that display up there is getting pretty dim. That fluorescent display has pretty much had it. Um, let's zoom back out. There we go. Yesterday, after I fixed the oscillator, I tried operating this, and when I put it into operating mode, high band worked. I could get heterodynes. It was doing what it was supposed to do. Low band didn't work, and I'm not surprised with the corrosion I see in here. Uh, oh, the VFO, by the way, is working. Uh, let me 
Let's see. At least it's working on high band, not on low band. Uh, let's go up here. I can pick that off at the input grid of the mixer. Let me come around this side. Do I have a convenient ground? Yeah, this will work. Nope, can't clip on that. Oh, this is ground. Okay. No, that's not ground. That's not ground. This is ground. That's ground. And this will be input to the mixer. There, you can see we have our VFO variable frequency oscillator. And you can see it shifting in frequency. Let me turn this brightness up a little bit. It's probably fine in the camera, but you can see the VFO working on high band, but as soon as I go to low band, it goes away, which again I'm not surprised about. Alright, it's a matter of you gotta be smarter than the equipment. There's about I don't know. I'll bet there's 30 different versions of these frequency meters probably 50 different versions of the schematic every one of them that I've ever seen has errors in it where they label capacitors and micro Henry's and they'll label coils and microfarads but there are certain positions on the dot on the dial that heterodyne against the local oscillator when you want to dial a frequency in, there's checkpoints. You go to certain frequencies, put the dial exactly on a certain setting, and you'll get a get a heterodyne, and they have what they call a corrector. Yeah, a corrector on this one. And you dial it in for a zero beat, and then turn off the local oscillator and just use the heterodyne oscillator, the variable oscillator for your radio alignment. And I think we can hear this if I bring the microphone over here. And you can see it on the scope. You can see the low frequency. And now I'm corrected. Then I would turn back to operate position. Go to the dial setting that's closest to the checkpoint and theoretically my heterodyne oscillator will be exactly on the frequency I want to tune my receiver to then you would do the same thing with your receiver heterodyne your receivers BFO against this oscillator all I got to do is get close to this thing because the shield is off but I still don't have any low frequency oscillator all I have is the high frequency one what you're seeing there is bleed through from the crystal oscillator but I should have a local oscillator and if I turn the volume down here you can see the frequency changing and you zero beat that against a uh, known position on the dial which will have a harmonic from the crystal oscillator similar to what you'd have on or a receiver from the 50s or 60s where you turn on a uh, crystal calibrator then zero beat your dial with the BFO turned on and then within say a 50 kilohertz range you'd know you were fairly accurate frequency wise well back in the day this would get them within say 50 Hertz of where they want to be when you have an agent in the field and he has to come up on the air, squirt out a uh, quick CW message from deep within enemy territory, say back in, you know, when we were fighting Germany. The operative couldn't stay on the air transmitting. He'd get zeroed in and, you know, he'd be executed. So the receiving end back in England, they knew what crystal frequency he'd be on, but back then your receivers only had an analog dial, so they would use one of these and they'd know, say, at you know, 9 o'clock at night, he's going to transmit. So they would use this device to be exactly, and exactly, plus or minus 50 hertz or 100 hertz. Probably better than 50 hertz. 
when they knew what they, you know, if you had a good skilled operator, it could get within 50 hertz. And he's going to hear that CW signal because the guy's probably only going to send it once, then shut down and get the hell out of Dodge before somebody shows up. The transmitting station in, in England had the freedom to transmit continuously 24 7 or whatever so that the agent could receive it in Germany. But the guy in Germany behind the lines had to get in, get out. He had to transmit and get off the air before they direction, you know, use DFing, direction finding to find him. So the receiving end on England, using only analog scales, a lot of times they were just using HROs that didn't even have frequency uh, divisions. It was just a scale division, one to 100. But they would use a device like this to dial in the exact receive frequency so that when that agent came up on a scheduled time, they were able to pick his signal off the air and get the information they needed. While I've got this shield off, I'm gonna show you an interesting feature in these, both the low frequency coil and this higher frequency coil have this shorted turn inductor shown here, shown here. And these are a bimetallic coil. This part here I think is just to help it couple capacitively to the coil, but there's a shorted turn inductor right here. And it's two dissimilar metals are bonded together and when one side gets hotter or warmer it bends by metallic strip. They've been around for a long time, which will open or close this coil. There's actually a coil. It's actually a coil of this bimetallic material. So as temperature changes start to affect the frequency of the coil, these compensate and keep it on, you know, keep the inductance consistent so the frequency doesn't shift. Pretty neat little feature and one of the reasons these things are so accurate and stable in operation. Alright, moving on with the, di uh, with the troubleshooting here. Well, what have I found so far? We have a feedback resistor here for the grid. 330K shunted with 15 picofarads. And if I connect here on the grid, which was there, and then the resistor is way down inside there. It's the only one that's not accessible. Everything else would be easy to change. And it comes back up to this lead here. It's measuring almost a mega ohm. It's gone way high. Which kind of makes sense why it would work on the high frequency but not on the low frequency. Just not enough feedback. But I shunted across it with another resistor here. It's the same path electrically. Still no oscillation. And I'm like, what the heck? And then I look here, and originally there's like Glyptol here on top of this nut. And I thought this little mark on the side was just the edge of the Glyptol. Well, I was mistaken. This is another trimmer cap. That this goes right down the side of this nut looking collar. So a second trimmer cap in a row with a broken collar on it which has allowed the rotating plates to slide down inside. Unbelievable. Two of them on the same unit. They must have had a whole run of bad trimmer caps at some point. And what made it noticeable was it's not flush with the top of the nut here. This one is. This one's still flush. The screw part isn't flush with the top of this collar. It's shaped like a nut. This one's dropped down inside a good 30 thousandths and that's enough to short the plates together. So I've got two trimmers in this unit that were bad. Now I'm going to do the same fix to this one. I'll take it apart it's going to throw the calibration completely off, but it's shot at this point anyway. It, it's absolutely worthless at this point. I'll just have to very carefully try to recalibrate this whole thing. 
Now I don't have a service manual for that. I have a field service manual and it says don't touch them. That's the, it says if you turn either one of these you will totally hose the calibration. Don't touch them. Well, I'm going to have to touch them. It's the only way to fix it. But there's no information on there on, on what points, you know, where to go in the frequency dial to recalibrate these two. So I'm just going to have to do my best guess. And I'm sure with the modern equipment I've got here, modern frequency counters and such, I can uh, get this thing back to some semblance of operation. So this is turning out to be more of a mechanical fix than anything. While I'm in there, while this is out of the way, I can probably get at that resistor that's hiding way down the bottom of this wafer switch. And I was going to, if this fixed it, this is the fix I was going to do. I was simply going to leave a resistor here. Because cutting all of these leads to get down in there would totally hose the calibration as well. But now since I have to take this out and cut a bunch of leads to get it out, I'm just going to go ahead and replace the resistor that's down in there with a correct value. And keep my fingers crossed. And if you need any more proof that that's the problem, I just turn that capacitor so that the plates were completely out of mesh. And bingo, my oscillator's back. So now I have the low frequency and the high frequency. The low frequency one's a lot higher in amplitude than the high frequency one. But they are both functional now. As soon as I flip to the low frequency one, you can see it's a much bigger. Now I, I've probably got too much feedback here because I added a capacitor and everything else. But I'll go in there, correct that resistance, and repair this variable cap and see what we can do about getting this thing back in calibration. And there it is, right down the side of it, just like the other one. Now these appear to be some sort of brass or bronze with a plating on them. And uh, I don't think that it's not silver because it's not tarnished, but I hope the camera can catch that. I think there, I think the light's got it right this time. You can see the crack right down the side. And it makes me wonder how long it's going to be before the other two that are in here fail. But, uh, good grief. Two in a row. We'll get it fixed. Okay, we have our repaired capacitor. We'll get this installed now. I'm going to leave this resistor here. To get to the one that's in there, I would have to disconnect everything from all of these coils, pull these resistors, that capacitor, it would be destructive. I, I would end up damaging something, especially trying to get this stuff off of these leads. I'd have to take all of these wires off to get this switch out of there. The, it's all the way down the bottom of that wafer switch. That's gone high enough in value. With the correct value plugged in here, I'm only about eight to ten percent low on resistance and as that resistor down in there becomes worse and worse this one will just come right back into where it belongs so I'm going to leave it. It's supposed to be 330k right now it's about uh, 285k with this one in parallel so I'm leaving it. I took that extra capacitor out that's not needed that was I was hedging my bets when I did that to see if that cap was bad, but it's not going to need this extra cap. This will provide enough feedback to the grid, and it may work. It may even work without this. In fact, I can give that a try once this is in here. The value of that resistor may not be all that critical. But this will do the job. I just can't believe two of these have failed. Now, I don't see any cracks. Like I say, the end of the shaft, this nut's a little thinner. You can see the shaft sticks up a little bit. That hex piece, it's not a nut. I keep calling it a nut. It's just a press-on collar. <clears throat> it's absolutely flush with the top of that screw shaft, whatever you want to call it. It's a 
screwdriver adjustment shaft. We'll get this in, we'll fire it up, and we'll see what we got. Okay, we've made a discovery. I was struggling to get this capacitor in here, inside of there. I was going to tear this coil up or bend the capacitor plate on one of these two in the process, and I just stopped and studied it for a bit. And the light dawned over Marblehead. This is a sub chassis. This comes out, there's three wires here, and they're easily accessible to desolder. One's the cathode, excuse, uh, one's the grid, one's the cathode, and a ground. And there's one additional wire connected here that goes up to the main tuning capacitor in the top of the unit. Now, there is absolutely zero access. I took the cover off the tuning cap. There's no way to access this wire at all. You'd have to disassemble the entire gear train capacitor. It's not worth it. But there is an access hole right here. Just big enough to get your soldering iron in and desolder the wire that goes up to the main tuning cap. So now I'll be able to get in there. And it won't, still won't be easy, but I'll be able to replace that resistor in its correct location. I can get in there with a soldering iron from both sides. I'll be able to put this into place and correctly rewire it like it should be without kludging it, trying to do it down through here. Uh, two screws on the front, one screw in the back. There's one screw inside here, two screws in the front and you have to remove two of the chicken head knobs and be advised there are torques and I just happen to have the right torques in my toolkit uh, so the chicken head knobs come off two screws in the front one screw inside these three wires and a fourth one here and it's out it slips right out of the unit they must make this as a sub assembly and drop it in and I'm glad I could get it out because I couldn't use my unit bit to drill this. It would have damaged this capacitor. So I had to drill this a little bigger to clear this hex with a standard drill bit. And they just leave a nasty burr on the inside. So now I can get in there and deburr that and clean it up. I'll feel a lot better about that being clean. <clears throat> and by the way, um, invariably when I do this type of a repair on something like this, I'll get a flurry of, you know, oh, I've got the model such and such, and you, can you tell me how to do this, or, you know, can you, it's not working, what do you think's wrong with it? I don't know. Uh, I, without having it in my hand, I can't tell you. I don't know anything about these other than we had them when I was in the military. They were a lot newer then, back in 1970. And we never took one apart. All we ever did is learn how to operate a variant. And I can't even tell you what variant it was. There's a dozen or more variants of this thing. This one happens to be the BC-221 Alpha Kilo, AK. And that's part of the BC-211 something or other, something or other. That's the assembly with the box and the manual and the cover. There's hundreds of variants and subvariants, and I have found tons of these schematics to be wrong. I found the one finally for the BC 221AK on uh, and radiomuseum.org. They actually had it, and I found the military manual that covers this one. This is the SCR 211AK which consists of the 221 AK and a whole bunch of accessories like headphones and so on and so forth. Again, I am not an expert on these. I am feeling my way through this for the first time. I've never had one of these on the bench. So if you've got one and it's not working, I can't help you. Unless it's sitting in front of me and I've got the documentation for it, I can't tell you what's wrong with it. All I can do is show you what went wrong with this particular variant these two capacitors, these molded paper caps, which were no good, uh, and so far one bad resistor. The other resistors in this unit so far have tested perfectly. 
This is the only one I found that's over twice what it should be. And it's the only one that doesn't have any access to it. Okay, uh, having said that, I didn't want to go on a rant there, but I always get people saying, oh, I've got the model such and such. And, you know, you, how do you fix that or how do you do that? I don't know. I have no clue. First time I've been inside of one of these, I'm a virgin. So I'm sure the guys out there who know how to work on these are laughing at me and saying, what a dumbass trying to do this with the thing in the unit. Never seen one before. But the more I looked at it, the more I realized that this wasn't part of the main chassis. It took a few minutes of staring at it to see that there was a screw here and two in the front and the thing would slip right out after four wires were desoldered. So that makes it a whole, oh, and this gives you a much better view of, let's see if we can keep it in focus, of that temperature compensating inductor that's in there and the one that's in here. Fantastic little units, but when the Germans got hold of some of these, they must have been aghast at how bad the documentation on a lot of these are. Looking through different schematics, they'll have, they don't have values on the schematic. They've got a reference number 12. You come down and look at 1250 picofarad. This one appears to be right, but I've looked at dozens of these in the process of trying to find the right one. And you'll find an inductor and it's labeled 25 picofarad. And you'll find a capacitor and it's labeled 27 microhenries or 12 microhenries or 5 microhenries. No, it's not an inductor, that's a capacitor. And it, it flip-flops back and forth. Sometimes you find capacitors and they say down here it's an inductor. And sometimes you'll see an inductor and down here it gives you a capacitance. I don't know how they ever worked on these things in the field. It, it just drives me crazy. Okay. Uh, I'm going to move on. I'm going to get that resistor changed. And uh, we'll drop this back in and see how I did. And one more thing. Now that I have this out where I can get a good look at it, I realize that this bimetallic coil is not the inductor. This outside ring is the shorted turn. And all this is doing is rotating inside the field and varying the coupling between the two coils to vary the frequency. Now that I have it out where I've got a solid look at it and I can touch the thing, the big ring on both of these is the shorted turn, is the shorted inductor that's shown on the schematic. Right here and right here. And as that bimetallic coil warms up or cools down, it's going to shift the position of that and vary the coupling between these two coils. That's how that thing works. Okay. Okay, everything's back together. Everything went back into place. And we've turned it on. It's been on for about five minutes. And we're sitting, I've got the master or crystal oscillator on the frequency counter. And we're eight, about two tenths of a hertz low. I think that's close enough. It's going to climb up as it warms up. It will slowly go up. It probably will end up one or two tenths high. But it pretty much stays around one hertz of error. Not an awful lot. Um, I've got the scope connected down here on the cathode or the crystal oscillator. I put a 10 puff cap in there for some isolation just so we don't load that oscillator and off the cathode which is a low impedance point. So it'll have negligible to no effect on the frequency of the oscillator. So that's good. So let's go back over and see if the VFO is working. Uh, go down here to the scope. And connect up here. Let's see what we've got. Okay, we're in crystal. I'll go to operate. We're on low frequency. 
and you can see the frequency changing as I turn the dial. Now this is going to be totally out of calibration at this point. But there's the high frequency. And again, the VFO is working just fine. Modulate, we've got our 390 hertz modulation. And crystal check, that's crystal check. Modulated signals, VFO high, VFO low. So now I've just got to work out how to calibrate this thing. So I'm going to sit here and study that for a while figure out where all the calibration points are and see if I can dial it in. Got a feeling this is going to be a real time consuming process. Seeing as I've never done it before, the people who did this at the factory were doing it all day, every day. <clears throat> and I'm sure there's some tricks I'm going to have to learn. Alright, we'll uh, come back when we've got something to show you. Well, this thing is incredibly accurate, uh, and the calibration was a snap, actually. <laughs> it was a piece of cake. What I did was I went to the front of the book, and this, this unit on low band goes from 125 kilohertz to uh, 2 megahertz, fundamental, and then there's... Uh, Oh boy, it is tough getting old. Harmonics. And you can use harmonics all the way up through. And the first crustal checkpoint was 125 kilohertz. And that was a dial setting of 214. So I set this to 214 with the corrector on zero. Watching my frequency counter, I went underneath and adjusted the low frequency pad until I had exactly uh, 125 kilohertz plus or minus about half a hertz and then I went all the way up to the other end of the dial and I picked the frequency that fell on an even number 247 megahertz and then you go to the closest crystal point which is 250 you dial in a 250 with a 4689, set the corrector so that there's, uh, till you null the uh, beat frequency, dial it back to 4612.2, or excuse me, uh, 4598.9, which is supposed to be 247 kilohertz, and this thing is dead nuts on at <laughs> 247 kilohertz, plus or minus about half a hertz. I am blown away at just how good this thing works from 1945. Amazing. After all the work I did, after all the stuff I disturbed underneath there, this thing just fell into calibration. And of course they warn you, you know, not to move those two trimmers because it'll be out of calibration. Nobody had a frequency counter back then. This thing would have had to have gone back to the United States and uh, been calibrated back in the U.S. probably, or back to at least a depot level repair facility. <clears throat> but today we have modern frequency counters and we have, you know, frequency standards. It makes it fairly easy to dial this thing in. It, it is just incredibly, incredibly accurate and it seems to hold plus or minus about one hertz over the whole warm-up period. I'm impressed. Uh, I'm going to do the high band next and see how that works out. Alright, as to be expected, it's not quite as accurate or it doesn't hold quite as well at the higher frequencies and that's absolutely normal for this type of a circuit. When I go to the check position, I've got 2 megahertz, four, I'm 4 hertz high there. That's when the corrector, I can dial the corrector in maybe a little bit better. Not the wrong way. I'm listening to the zero beat in the headphones. And remember, there's, you know, one or two hertz error in the crystal oscillator. So, that says I'm at two megacycles. Two, two, two and four. Two megacycles plus four, uh, four hertz high. 
Now it's running two oscillators, however, though. It's running the crystal oscillator and it's running the VFO. When I switch it to the operate position, it is going to turn off the voltage, the anode voltage, to the um, crystal oscillator. And I do that to save battery. Normally these ran on battery. And I go to the operate position and the frequency changes a little bit. I go back, there's our 4 hertz, I go to operate and it changes a little bit. You're getting a voltage change on the anode of the VFO because we've taken one tube out of circuit. But we're still 98, we're within 2 hertz. We're still within 2 hertz. We're 2 hertz low now. Instead of being 4 hertz high, we're 2 hertz low for 2, two megahertz. That's pretty damn good. <laughs> I am uh, I'm blown away by this thing. Absolutely blown away by it. I never expected it to be this good. But I guess it had to be. Uh, when they had to find hear that operative out in the field, when they absolutely positively had to be on frequency to catch that operative. And again, uh, there'd be a listening station back in England or someplace, someplace safe. And they knew that their field operative, you know, in, in enemy territory was going to come up on a, say, 2 megahertz frequency at 9 p.m. exactly. And he'd probably be on the air for less than a minute. He'd get in there, send his information, coded information as quickly as he could, and then shut down his transmitter and get the hell out of Dodge because you don't want to get picked up by the... Uh, the Gestapo or you know whoever <clears throat> so that operating uh, the listening station had to be on frequency they knew what his crystal was set for he probably had one crystal or two crystals different frequencies depending on what time of day he was going to be transmitting and again the old receivers the HRO doesn't even read out in frequency it had a calibration chart on the front of it and, uh, you know, they may have had a, a, a SX-28 Halicrafters or something, but again, analog dial. So they would use this thing to send out, it transmits, that signal right there is coming out of this antenna jack right here. And they'd put a stub antenna, turn on the BFO on the receiver until they had it zero beat, then turn this off and they knew their receiver was exactly on that crystal frequency within plus or minus a couple of hertz so when that operative came up on the air they'd be on his frequency and they'd hear him. They'd probably be three or four receivers all listening to him. I'd imagine they didn't rely on one because of you know different parts of the country is going to have different reception but they'd combine what they received from him and if everybody agreed they knew they had the, the message correct. Amazing though, amazing that 80 years later, this thing is within a handful, one handful of hertz consistently. And it's drifting a little bit as time goes by now. It's uh, 995, so we're off 5 hertz. Well, not even, almost, uh, almost 4 hertz. It's, it's 9598. Oh, there's 6, 96, so 3 hertz. Oh, 4 hertz, rather. It's off 4 hertz. Amazing. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Certainly good enough to pick up that guy in the field. Okay, there's a lot of guys uh, on the internet to show you how this thing works, but I just wanted to put it out there, the troubles I found. Maybe somebody who has one of these and is working on it and having issues with it. Maybe if it's a, a 221AK of the same lot, maybe they have the same problems with theirs that this one had. That's it for now. I'm the Radio Mechanic. Hope uh, somebody found this interesting. We'll catch up with you later. See ya. Alrighty, we have the unit back in its case. Back in its home. And in the base of this box is an AC power supply. Some of these, uh, or you could order a... Uh, I guess they could supply an AC supply if it was required. Probably the listening posts like back in England during the day use an AC supply. Normally this runs on batteries. There would be four 
BA24s, I think they were, basically number six dry cells in series to power the heaters. Now the heaters draw 800 something, 830 milliamp years, I think. So I can't imagine the A battery life was very long, but they say to warm the thing up for 15 minutes. And uh, I can't imagine, they must have gone through batteries like crazy in these things. And then there was uh, six 22 and a half volt batteries totaling up to 135 volts for the uh, B supply. Or you could get the AC supply, which this one has. Now I came down here this morning and turned this thing on and I had my counter hooked up to it. And it was eight tenths of a hertz high, 0.8 hertz high when I came down this morning. It's been sitting here for well over an hour and a half running with the power supply in the base and everything all closed up, warming it up. And it is now approximately 1.4 hertz high. So I think that's pretty good for a crystal oscillator that's not in an oven and subjected to that kind of a temperature swing. Now because this thing ran on batteries, of course it wouldn't have a crystal oven. Uh, it would just suck the batteries flat a lot much faster. This is your lookup table for frequencies. Now this is not the correct one for this device. Every one of these units would have had a handwritten, you can see all the, all the writing down here, this was done with what looks like a fountain pen. Uh, these were all characterized by hand before they left the factory and there's, these are supposed to have the serial number written here which would match the serial number on the data plate because there are no two variable capacitors that are absolutely identical. As the plates engage and disengage there's, you know, there's some unevenness in the metal and it's going to shift the frequency one way or the other. Every one of these had to be hand characterized through its entire frequency range. And in this case, it's every 100 hertz here. Every 100 hertz, and on the higher end of the dial, it looks like they're just going for the megahertz or the 100 kilohertz. They're not going for the 100 hertz. But can you imagine how long this took back in the factory to hand? characterize every one of these against the frequency standard and remember they didn't have digital frequency counters Hewlett Packard was making an analog frequency meter but you know it's like reading a voltmeter it's going to have some you're going to have to do interpolation on the scale so how they managed to calibrate all of these in that in that time frame I don't know this follows this fairly closely, but as I got down, I'm noticing that I was changing a couple of the minor divisions up here on the scale to make the frequency accurate, and I'm not surprised. And that's not because I took it apart. This is all how this uh, variable capacitor for the main capacitor is calibrated. Like I say, every single one of these, when it left the factory, had one of these books that was unique to that unit. And because this thing was put together out of bits and pieces, the guy that sold it to me knew what he was doing. I got taken, but so be it. I learned something just from working on this. This says BC221 Alpha Lima AL, and this is not the correct schematic for the unit that I have. The unit I have is an AK, and it took me a while to, to identify it, but the layout and the chicken head knobs gave it away. And once I had this designation, I was able to track down the correct schematic for my unit. This, I don't know what it came from or what, you know, it, it came from a similar unit at some point in time. They were all very, very, very similar. But all of these handwritten notes here, these handwritten uh, dial markings or dial units, are for a specific one. So I'll have to recreate this book page by page to uh, uh, have an accurate 
you know an accurate scale because the way this is supposed to work if you want 150.1 kilohertz you dial it to 1174.1 and in my case it'll be some other number because the variable capacitor in here one will not be absolutely 100 percent identical to the one that this was written for but that's okay the you <coughs> the unit's working well and sometime here I'll sit down <clears throat> and make up a chart I'll probably also print out the correct schematic and glue it in here and then give it a coat of uh, clear to protect it because this goes to an AL not an AK uh, this does not the AL did not have the uh, shorted loop on the uh, bimetallic strip and it's got different values of capacitors every one of these is a little bit different uh, I guess that's about it there's plenty of videos out there of guys showing you how to use these with a receiver I don't have an old analog shortwave receiver anymore I sold my uh, Helicrafters SX28 a few years ago. I simply wasn't using it. Uh, it was a beautiful receiver. I kind of regret selling it. I had the matching Helicrafters speaker and it was a wartime speaker. It didn't have the, uh, the letter H on the grill. They did that to preserve uh, aluminum during the war. The wartime versions of the Helicrafters speaker did not have the Helicrafters H. But it was sitting here, sitting here, sitting here years at a time. I'd turn it on once a year maybe and play with it. And I just figured I'd pass it on to somebody else who would uh, get more use and more appreciation out of it. Kind of wish I had it now, but that's all right. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this one up and call it done. I hope uh, I helped somebody out there who's having problems with one of these. If you've got an AK and you're having issues with it, oscillators won't run, check those variable caps. And make sure you replace all the paper caps in there, these big honking paper caps, before uh, you power it up or the smoke's going to leak out. Won't hurt anything, but uh, it won't function either. Those two didn't split, just this one did. This one took the brunt of it, and it was just hissing and smoking and split the case wide open. I wish I had uh, filmed it. Alrighty, see you later. Thanks for stopping by. Oh, and I just noticed the uh, error has shifted back. It's now only 1.1 hertz high on the crystal oscillator. So maybe there's some kind of temperature compensation built into that uh, crystal as well. I don't know. But uh, I know there's no heater in there. It's just a simple crystal in the can. See ya.